All right, what's up, everybody? It's your boy BQ here. This is the B Side Podcast Slam Anniversary Review with my boy Ro. Kyle, Trent, and J Bone are ready on the Impact Lounge channel, reviewed the show, but we're going to review it as well because it's a damn good pay per view. Ro, what'd you think about this pay per view as a whole? Did it deliver like you had hoped it would? Yeah, I thought it was solid, man. Um, that was just my thing. I just said, hopefully, they, they deliver like they always do for Slam Anniversary. I just had a, some minor criticisms, and I know we'll get into them, but yeah, from top to bottom, I was really entertained. I will say, and we're going to get into it, I will say seven out of the eight matches I really enjoyed. There was one that I really didn't care for. Uh, we'll talk about it when we get to that, and and the reasons for that and everything, but overall, really, really solid. There were a couple moments that I would have done something a little bit differently, but Moose, Sammy Callahan, guys like this, they got on social media, said this was going to be the pay-per-view, the pay-per-view of the year for any company. And I can't say I watch any other company besides AEW, but it's hard to imagine someone out doing this show. Um, I watched Double, Double or Nothing and Fighter Fest. I don't think either of those were better than Redemption or um, Slammiversary. Have you watched anything else? You, you watch Usually you watch some of the WWE pay-per-views, right? Yeah, I watched the Fighter Fest, um, and I kind of just took that more as it was like their house show. And yeah. I think the thing with AEW where it's hard to compare is they're still starting up. So, you know, they're probably going to get a lot of benefit. Whereas if you're comparing it to an Impact pay-per-view, you know, most people are going to expect them to be better since they have the experience underneath their belt. But, you know, the one thing I'll say, and I, I don't know if we want to get into it, but I thought the thing that kind of I was kind of disappointed is we didn't really get any title changes and I know it's something had occurred uh, nights before this event but you know you look at Slammiverse and you look at Bound for Glory as the two major events in Impact where those are the events you know some titles changing you can look back in the history of Slammiverse every year there's at least one belt changing just because that's like the the big moment where, you know, baby face gets her comeuppance or, you know, heel, whatever. And I just kind of just felt like with this one, you know, everyone retained and that kind of threw me off a little bit. Yeah. You know, and if impact were to do a pay-per-view every single month, that might be different. Now that you're, they're probably going to argue, well, the titles changed at the impact plus show or the, Tw I guess it was on Twitch or whatever that the titles changed there. Okay. You, you could probably argue that. Okay. That happened live. But they don't run pay-per-views every single month. Now, if, you know, if they did, you could say, okay, well, you know, pay-per-view A comes, titles change, pay-per-view B comes, everyone keeps the title. That's cool because that's realistic. But we only get four pay-per-views a year right now. And because we're so accustomed to tape shows and we already know who's, in, in many cases, unless you're pretty good at avoiding the spoilers, in many cases, you know when the title's going to change ahead of time. So this is an opportunity to, you know, give us something on the fly, something, something live, something that we can, a title change that we can react to and start investing in. Everyone kept the belts was not, which was not something we had anticipated. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I thought at least one and, you know, last thing I'll add, like credit to them to finally doing something as far as, and you and I have talked about this in past years about with the one night only is doing title changes, you know, to get people invested. However, to do it, you know, a couple of nights before you have your pay-per-view, like I would have rather them save the title change for the pay-per-view, you know, but Hey, you know, it is what it is. We'll get into the first match. This was the TJP X Division Open Challenge. I think we had we had previously thought that TJP was going to go out there, issue an open challenge very similar to what Ace Austin did, and someone was going to come out. Maybe maybe a little bit of a surprise. They announced it on Instagram, I believe, uh, doing a live stream. Willie Mack, Jake Christ, and Trey from the Rascals. So, you know, was this really an open challenge? Yeah, they probably didn't need to book it that way. They could have probably just booked the, the match. Just let us know in advance what we were going to get. You know, but whatever. You know, it's the opening match. Um, really fun, really fast, really uh, high-paced. I would have liked really, you know, I know they're not going to do it, but I would have liked to have seen Dave Chris in the match. Like, 
give this dude some kind of run. I mean, every time that it's, you know, a member of OBE, they throw Jake out there and I get, I get that he's kind of the athletic one and this and this, but you know, we're going to have to start investing in OBE as a tag team again here soon. Like one week incredibly, you know, a credible tag team. Cause they don't really, I mean, they wrestle, but they don't really compete in the tag team division right now with the feud Sammy always has going on. So, you know, give us, give us a chance to get invested in a Dave also. So that we don't feel like it's a one person tag team. Yeah, I get you. It's strange, man, because, you know, this is stems back to homecoming when they had the vacant ultimate X match. Well, for the vacant X division title and we seen Jake compete and it's like, OK, that's cool. Not only they're a tag team, you know, you got Jake who can compete in the X division. And I thought Dave, you know, probably just can do the mid card from time to time. But, you know, we see now it's really just Jake. And like Dave, you know, he goes in accompanies and stuff and, you know, makes me wonder, you know, why they don't let him do any type of single single matches, you know, more often and whatnot. Yeah, because if you remember Redemption in the opening match, it, w- it was Jake again. You know what I mean? So when Dave competed for the Ultimate X qualifier, I mean, he had one of the quicker matches. It's it's kind of like they, they don't want to put him on TV. They, you know, but give us give us a chance to get into him and see what he can do as well. You know. yeah, let me ask you, you just your opinion you know and we we're accustomed to getting these matches every pay-per-view you know in the past it was mainly like an x division exhibition but you know right now it's a little little blend do you like having these random matches with no implications like are you okay with that or do you kind of wish there was some type of purpose whether it's a future title shot or something something else you know when when you start getting into multi-man matches yeah usually I think there should be some kind of implications. I always think random multi-man matches are kind of silly. Like they mean nothing overall, you know, especially Mm -hmm. because there's no feud. Like what the hell they fight. If there's no build up to the four way, four way match, then what are they fighting for? So this is a really good opportunity to just hey number one contender for the X division championship. Cause we, you do, you and I have been talking about this forever that when it comes to number one contenders, more often than not, they're, they're very random or they're, um, you know, someone just decides they want to challenge for the title and boom, there it is. Like we don't, we don't get anything, any kind of tournaments, any kind of battle Royals, any kind of nothing. It's just, we, the, the number one contendership, like why not build towards, you know, being a contender. So there's this four way match. Willie Mack wins this thing. And maybe maybe this is because we talked about what the hell Swan going to do after this because we thought Swan was going to lose. Maybe maybe this actually starts a program with Willie Mack and Rich Swan going forward. But, you know, why not make it a number one contenders match? No, I, I agree. And, you know, the one thing that I took away, too, was, you know, Willie Mack got the win. But it's like I feel they could be doing so much more with Willie Mack. He seems so just kind of just thrown, you know. Well, if they have a six-man tag match, you know, he's teaming up with Swan. Like, they just have him all over the place. He's a guy that, you know, should be, you know, is capable of standing on his own and, you know, working some type of angle, you know, whether it is going for the X Division title or, you know, potentially the main event scene down the road. So, you know, that, that's just my thing is just when we get these matches, like, yeah, they're good to open up the show, but it's like, why are these guys wrestling? You know, they're just, you know, trying to kill themselves just for the sake of killing themselves. Or is there something on the line, you know, a future title shot or something of like that. But I mean, it's fun. It's, it's fun to open up the pay-per-views like this. They've been doing it forever, but you know, put, put something on the line. You got the rascals who are challenging for the titles. And then you've got this guy, you know, Trey, he's the odd man out. Like actually at least made him look, make him look like he's competing for something. But, you know, that being said, I thought the match absolutely freaking killed it. I mean, they did some really great spots here. They, I mean, I was worried that they weren't going to be able to follow up or be able to follow up after this. I mean, this match was so crazy. Bodies fa- flying all over the place. Did you expect Willie Mack to pull this out? I mean, did... I, I really felt like even once we knew who the competitors were that TJ, uh, T, I was going to say TJ Max, I, I keep doing that. Um, I thought TJP was going to win. And that's who I thought originally. And I just, cause when I, you know, seen him, cause I forgot the, how th- this match had even got set up. 
and I seen him, I'm like, oh, God, like, I hope they're not going to give this guy a win. Like, that's so typical, you know, well, I hate to say TNA, but, you know, TNA would do that. And I think when I knew Mac was going to win is the moment when Chris hit the Chris Cutter. And, you know, I, I was like, watch, he's going to hit the frog splash the moment he tries to get up. And it's good that Mac got the win, but it's just like, now is there a way for them to build off of this, to kind of give him some sort of direction? Or in a couple of weeks, are we going to see him in some random tag with Swan and Dreamer facing OVE? It was good to see Trey get some some singles running here. And he's very similar to Jake Chris in the sense that that he's very rarely... I mean, it's it's similar. It's not the same situation, but he's very rarely involved in the Rascals when it's a tag team, when it's a two man team, um, and he's he's usually that singles guy. I used to say this back in the day watching the uh, the New Day. You know, they always say, "Oh, you never know which two are going to fight," but it's the same two fighting every single time. And I, I I get that with the Rascals too. It's like it's almost like they deliver like they have some kind of three man advantage, but it's it's the same two dudes always wrestling. And then Trey always does the the singles competition matches. I felt like you might as well have made this a six man match. You know, might as well throw Ace Austin in there and and whoever else. But overall, uh, really great match. Willie Mack gets the win. Next match on the card. So we got a, a title match pretty early. This is going to be the North defending against LAX and the Rascals. Now, the first thing I thought when this was happening. Because last year's Slammiversary, we had the opening match. I forgot what it was, but it was really good. And then after that, I think, was the Eli Drake Open Challenge. I think that was match number two. Ellsworth came out. And then after that was the the match where Tommy Dreamer came out to team with Eddie. And it, it deflated me, dude. You know, I talked about this a lot. Those two matches deflated me. And I had a hard time enjoying the rest of the paper. Even though it was a killer pay-per-view, it was, it was good. I'm not, not Slammiversary. I'm sorry, Bound for Glory. Talking about Bound for Glory. It was a good pay-per-view, but those two matches drained me so much that I, I really had a hard time enjoying the rest of the show. This was really, really different because we got that amazing match to kick it off, and then we get another amazing match. I was so happy the North won the titles. I was so happy they got thrown into here because I really was not invested in LAX versus the Rascals even a little bit. I, I just wasn't. Um, no, no offense to anyone involved. I just wasn't, personally. But I'm a bigger fan of the North than I am both of those teams. So I um, was really excited. And Josh Alexander, someone asked me the other day who my favorite wrestler was. And I said it was Moose right now, man. Josh Alexander's up there, dude. Like, I really freaking like this dude. I like everything about him. I think he's a very uh, blue chipper signing. And he has uh, really brought the best out of Ethan Page as well. So um, I'm loving the North. And... You know, this match was real similar to the opening one. A lot of really, really cool, cool spots. Just great wrestling. I mean, there's, there's every team had moments where it looked like they were going to win this thing. What do you got on the uh, tag team title match? You know, I think it seemed like it ended uh, abruptly due to the injury of Santana. But yeah, everyone got their moment to shine. Um, I'm a fan of the North, too. I kind of hate how they started out where they had them lose early on i always kind of believe when you have uh, trying to debut anybody you know you don't want them taking losses early and i've always thought with lax lax needed a, a main antagonist they had it for a moment with ove and then ove you know ended up becoming what they became and i thought with the north like that's the one team that i could buy into dethroning them as as champions and so now that they've done that, like, I'm happy with it. But, yeah, um, I like this. My favorite spot in this match was when uh, Alexander did that. I think it's a, it's a fall away, but he did it from the turnbuckle, off the turnbuckle, and it was like a moonsault. And then Ethan Page did the swanton. Like, they got great chemistry. And, um, you know, I'm glad that they retained because one of my fears was they did the title change to kind of sell the pay-per-view and to make this a triple threat match. And a part of me thought they were going to put the titles back on LAX and I'm glad they didn't. And I'm, I'm glad they stayed the course and the North retained. I'm glad they did too. Um, the North has a lot of really great tandem moves and that's why I like them so much. Santana got hurt in this match. I think, I think it was a legit injury. Um, it's possible that it wasn't and they just did a really good job of acting and they were just trying to write LAX out of the company. Who really knows? But um, 
he did appear to get injured, didn't come back in the match, and it, it did seem like maybe they ended it kind of abruptly. And when Ortiz took the pin, that kind of made me think, I know it was already rumored LAX was done, but the fact that Ortiz took the pin, you know, after, frankly, a couple of years of dominance by LAX, told me they were, they were probably done. And I thought the North looked really good. This, this match was like tornado tag, so, you know, everyone was just in the match going crazy. Um, really delivered for me. I think the North was the right team right now to be the champions, the right people to beat. LAX and I, I just as I said I was glad they were included in the match because I just wasn't wasn't super excited even though I said it had the potential to be the match of the night I just at the same time I wasn't like super invested in it but the Rascals are, are looking really really good in the ring just really starting to find themselves and um, LAX looked good too but I can't help but to think LAX overall here you know barring this Santana injury of course just just a, li a little weak in comparison the way that they normally do yeah you know but it's one of these things and I mean I know there's rumors about LAX's potential departure but regardless of that I think this is the time now you know the north is at the top of the tag division since they're champions you know, hopefully they take this opportunity to build some of these other teams up so we don't fall into the same trap that we did with LAX where they're running through everyone. It Like, I'm guessing right now I'm going to assume we're probably going to get the North and the Rascals mixing it up. You know, drag that out a little bit and in the meanwhile try to build someone else up so then once that's done, you know, you can move on. Yeah, I would imagine they're going to work in a program together too. And LAX got bland to me. They they just really did. I mean, we know this is one of the best tag teams in the world, but you and I talk about this on the podcast, on the on offline. We we have been saying for a while how you know, they just keep running through everybody and it's like what else can they do? So they just start getting bland to me. So, you know, that's probably more why I wasn't really looking forward to the match, not not so much because of the rascals. I know I said I don't really care for the gimmick, but I mean, what they do in the ring is amazing. So, as I said, I you know I had match of the night potential, just wasn't wasn't super excited for it. And um, the Rascals in the North, if they do a program together, should be really entertaining. The next match was my match of the night, and it was uh, Killer Cross versus Eddie Edwards. This was the first blood match. Killer Cross came out looking like seven from WCW. <laughs> but, that's what I was thinking. I was looking at him, man, and I was like, "Why do I feel like I've seen somebody before?" And then it, it, it dawned on me when I see someone post a picture up. That's when uh, uh, Gold Dust, when he had went to WCW, right? Right, right. And okay. but, but what an entrance! This was a great entrance by Killer Cross. And you know what I like with these pay per views is the audio is so much better because um, it's not a you know, it's not pre-taped where you've compressed the audio and did this and this. And this. It, it's a live broadcast, so you hear things a little more for what it is. And, and you know, I've kind of complained that oftentimes when you watch Impact, you can't hear the wrestler's music. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's compressed down along with the crowd because they want us to hear Josh and uh, Don super crystal clear. Uh, but I just enjoyed actually being able to hear Eddie Edwards' music for once because I, I love his music. And this match, you know, we... We've speculated to cross his future with the company. I mean, this is a clean sweep. Eddie Edwards beat him three to nothing. So, you know, this was something we talked about too. Like, why are they even fighting if it's not a rubber match at this point? If it's 2-0, like, why, why are they continuing? You know, overall, Cross gets three losses here. So it's hard to imagine him coming back to the company after this. You know, but perhaps this is signs of what is to come because... I mean, God, zero oh, and three versus Eddie. Like, where that? Where do you go from there? That's that's rough. But I will say he. I mean, he had um, the the Roman numerals of Slammiversary on his pants. So he, you know, he was looking good. He was looking apart. The match killed it. I I loved it. I loved every moment of it. Cross was really really dominant for a long time, which which told me usually when you have these gimmick matches, and one guy is dominant for a majority of it, it means they're gonna lose. You know, it's like when you have a last man standing with a big dude versus a little dude, you know, the big dude wins for 99% of the match. You know, the little dude is going to obviously win. And uh, that, that's what I don't like about a lot of these type of matches. You know, they kind of give away the winner by the way that uh, everything's going on. But just like the first couple of matches, 
these guys put their bodies on the line, did a lot of shit that really looked like it hurt. And the finish of this match where he broke Kenny in half, and this that name Kenny 2.0 I think is awful, but <laughs> he, they broke Kenny <laughs> broke Kenny in half and I mean what a what a finish. I you know, I was saying like I'm I'm ready for a good Eddie match. Like I feel like in the last 2 3 years Ever since Slammiversary, where he teamed up with Alicia, like we don't get any good Eddie Edwards matches at the pay per views for one reason or another. Uh, not really his fault, but just, you know, we talked about Eli Drake leaving it, you know, being let go at the last moment, things like that. We just haven't gotten that good Eddie match, and the finish with this was freaking amazing. Like the way Cross after the match was just bloody and dripping from the mat, just laying, oh my God, dude, he was, so, he's, so, he's a pro. He's a, God, talk to me about this match. Yeah, walking into this, like, the, the, anytime I see a first blood match, I'm always interested to see what's the way of the finish. Because, you know, often you see it's a chair shot or, um, you know, something with an object. And obviously this was no different, but the fact that he was actually stabbed and crossed, I thought was pretty brutal. You know, for as great as this was, I think what took me out of this, and, you know, this is something we've mentioned before, I think when we know sometimes or we're having a match where we know one of the participants can be potentially leaving, like it takes me out because I don't expect them to have a chance to win. And just for this, the the way that they close out, and like you just mentioned, the sweep, like it was inevitable that Eddie was going to win. But with that said, I, I like the creativity that they did as far as the way of making Cross bleed because that was my first thing. I'm like, how's he going to bust them open? You know, like Cross was this dominant force compared to Eddie and um, they made it work. So kudos to them. So the match we get after this is um, this, this was the one match of the night that I, I wasn't into it, dude. Uh, Moose versus RBD Moose. um, I liked his entrance a lot. Moose, as I've always said, over delivers at the pay-per-views. He always has. And I thought he put on a really good showing here, but you know, the match was really one sided for the most part. RBD cut a promo beforehand where, I mean, I, I don't I don't mean to I know it's kind of a running joke with RBD, but I mean I think he was high for the promo. He didn't really seem like he was engaged with what the storyline was or what the match was even about. I mean he just it, it was super standard. I wasn't excited for it. Like he didn't get me jazzed up for the match. You know, he was getting his ass kicked for, for most of the match. Looked like damn near looked like Jeff Hardy out there when he wrestled Sting. Forgot the pay per view what it, what it was. Uh, Victor Road. Victory Victory Road. I mean, I know that's being a little dramatic, but I mean, he just he didn't look like he was on his he wasn't crisp like he wasn't on his game out there like he was just just getting his ass kicked. And then, you know, when he was doing his his spots like, you know, I've I've never really even though I appreciate what they bring to the table, I've never really enjoyed wrestlers like RVD, um, Rey Mysterio guys who just like they have that move set that you just get every single match. And it's, it's, it's like, you've seen this before, you know what I mean? Like it's, they're not bringing a whole lot new to the table. So you have three matches up to this point where they're bringing a lot new to the table. You know, they're just, they're just being innovative. And then you get this match and RVD's just, when he has his offense, he's just playing the hits, you know, like he, like he would on episode of impact or on the Indies. So I thought Moose deserved a lot better than this. And, um, I did like when Moose <laughs> went for the five star frog splash. Like that actually cracked me up. And, uh, you know, I thought the match was unimagined. The, the finish was a little unimaginative, you know, RVD missing a splash landing on a chair. Like it's, it's just stuff we've seen with him before. Like, I really thought this was going to be a match that we saw a lot of new shit and we just, we just didn't RVD looks really old. He looked tired. You know, Moose looked like the star he always is, but Moose picks up the win. Thank God. You know, this, this was hopefully something that will catapult him forward, hopefully into the world title picture next. what do you think about this one? Yeah, I was just surprised that Moose won because I really thought that RVD, especially the spot when he hit the Van Daminator, I thought I was like, all right, so uh, this is going to be it. And I agree with you. I think that's the thing that we see with some of these wrestlers who, you know, in their prime, you know, their style was just predicated off of getting all their stuff in. And you see as they get older, you know, they can't 
like with RVD, for example, I look at some of the stuff, it's not as crisp as it once was. And what you have to do as a performer, the older you get, you kind of have to evolve. You know, you've got to work to your limitations. Um, yeah, I believe Moose deserves better. I mean, you know, he's beating a legend. I guess he can say he beat a former uh, Impact World Champion. So hopefully that kind of, they find some kind of way to kind of get him back in the mix. Because I feel ever since, you know, I want to say just a few months ago when he was, uh, it was him and Cross and Cage when they were all chasing Johnny for the title. Um, ever since then, it's like they just kind of pushed him further and further and further away from the title picture. And I know not everybody can be challenging for the title, but I do think it's important to have a couple of names that you could plug in and plug out from time to time you know, to keep things fresh. So hopefully that's the route that they're going next with Moose. Yep, I hope he's the next guy going for going after Brian Cage. I really do. I really, really do. After this, we get the knockouts title match. Speaking of another amazing match, these women killed it out there. We're talking f- four women with fairly different wrestling styles that all just really, really work together. I like Taya's entrance a lot. I always, I always stop what I'm doing for Taya's entrance. I really enjoy it. Um, they did all sorts of cool shit in this match. Um, I thought Sue had a chance of winning this thing um, because they've been tension, you know, teasing tension between her and Havoc, which is a little early for that. But I thought there was a chance Sue was going to pull this out. Uh, but when Havoc hit that tombstone off the second rope, which was amazing, I thought I thought that was the match. I really did because uh, Rosemary and Taya had just went through the table. You know, I think Taya might have got up a little quick from that, but you know that. I didn't see that coming, you know, good, good on the chair, on the uh, camera angles where we didn't see the chair shot. And then Ty steals the win. Like I thought it was a great win. I thought the right person won. I was entertained with the entire thing, the entire thing. Yeah, by far. I was just surprised at some of the spots they were doing and nobody got busted open or we didn't see any uh, color. Because that was, the, you know, the one thing I can't recall watching a women's hardcore match and seeing anyone get busted open. Um, the thing that I love when you have multi-man or multi-woman title matches is because the, the one thing that I like about it is, like, coming out of this now, we now got two additional feuds. You can go Taya versus Rosemary, and then you can do the Sue versus Havoc. So it's like, even though... You know, have the multi-woman match and, you know, the champion retained, there's still something that comes out of it. And then you still can always, you know, run, well, not so much run it back, but, you know, these individuals can be challenging Taya you know, in one-on-one matches. So, yeah, I think it was a win-win. This one, you know, I'm not going to say it was my match of the night. I'll say it was my second match of the night. But, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this. Rich Swan took on Johnny Impact after this X Division title match. This was one that I, I think – caught us off guard. We didn't know Johnny impacts contract situation. It's rumored that he's done with the company, but he might be trying to rework a new contract with them. But this was one where we really thought Johnny was going to win and do something, you know, put a, the X division title on a main eventer and maybe trying to get to the next level a little bit, keep Johnny impact in the X division for a little while and just kind of having a different style of match. And we're, you know, accustomed because since he's been in the company, we, you know, it was a lot of, versus Eli Drake, a lot of versus uh, uh, Brian Cage, you know what I mean? Like, he, he, we, they, they haven't really diversified his opponents very well, you know. Um, aside from he had a match with Phoenix, which was really good. But for the most part, it's kind of like the same dudes. So that's what was really refreshing about this match. And, uh, you know, we got we kind of got to see him do an X-Division style for a little bit. And I keep saying these matches are killing it, but they're all killing it. They, they, they're killing it i mean i don't know how else to say it but rich swan picked up the win here and the way he won really made him look good really make him look strong um i really think there's a program with willie mack after this i i have to believe there is i can't think what other direction they could possibly go be going with it but you know this one was a surprise what you think yeah, I'm going to say the same thing. I really thought that this was going to be the title that changed hands only because from seeing the past couple months of Impact, they're obviously high on Swan. So I thought this would have been their way of taking the belt off of Swan and moving him in a main event program. 
and and you know obviously we didn't get that and i mean if it's due to johnny's contract situation i mean that makes sense but yeah uh, swan delivered um you know you got to give them credit and you know i'll be the first to say i'm not high on him but it's always great when you see talents, you know, being misutilized in one place. They come over here and, you know, they're given an opportunity. And it seems like with Swan, he's been given a golden opportunity to, you know, work, you know, with big names and stuff. I feel he's done everything he has possibly could can in the X Division. So hopefully, um, eventually, once they take the title off him, he'll be a guy that they probably should look to elevate. Yeah, and I think he resigned with the company kind of long term recently so you know they should continue to build this dude and i agree that he's kind of done everything he can do in the x division that's why i really thought he was dropping the title so after you beat johnny impact like shit there there's no one at that point that's going to pose more of a challenge for you so that's why the willie mac situation makes sense where it's kind of friend versus friend maybe mac turns on him Uh, i got, got a pretty good gut feeling that we're going that direction uh, but I was really, really shocked to see Johnny take the loss. I mean, the first thing I thought as a ref count of three is like, wow, this dude was just the world champion. Um, and here he is losing in the X Division title title match. So uh, excellent match. And this was a far cry from last year when they were expected to open Slammiversary in a random four-way match. Like now they're, you know, uh, the semi-main and uh, X Division title on the line. So you know, kudos to these guys. Kudos to these guys. Much props. Main event in the evening: Brian Cage versus Michael Elgin. Now we didn't, or at least I wasn't sure if <laughs> Cage was going to wrestle. You know, I was. Uh, I read in one place that he wasn't going to, and then I had someone else telling me that he he wasn't going to. But then I heard someone tell me he was going to, and I think there was some truth to that. That he, I think they were prepared for him not to wrestle. And to give him a surprise opponent. And this this is what I truly think happened. I think they were prepared for him not to be able to compete. And if that was the case, they were going to, going to need to give Michael Elgin a new opponent. It was going to be a surprise opponent. Brian Cage, turns out he could wrestle. He could go. And then we gave Rhino later in the match. So I think Rhino was the was going to be the opponent for, Cage, for Elgin if necessary. But he came out, and the reason I say that is because his involvement in the match was was very random. And the good thing about it is that it it actually takes Elgin out of the title picture for a bit because now he can spin off and do another feud. But this match, I have not seen a heavyweight title match like this that I can recall. The effort that they were putting into this, like th- this was this was like Haas versus Haas, like two big dudes going at it, being heavyweights, but then showing what else they can do. Also, the freaking reversal of the F5 into the Canadian Destroyer. Like, holy shit, man. Bananas. Freaking bonkers. This was one of the best main events Impact's had in a while. But I'm going to say, man, they have been delivering in the main event every year. You know, the last one that was a stinker was Eli Drake versus... Johnny Impact, where Alberto came out. After that, these main events, you know, you had the Moose versus Aries one, which no one wanted to see, and then it ended up being amazing. The Aries versus Johnny Impact was amazing. Um, Johnny Impact versus Cage, like they they keep coming with these badass main events, and this one here was crazy. What do you got? Yeah, this was my match of the night, and it was just surprising because. <clears throat> this was the one I was kind of worried just for the simple fact of Cage's health. I didn't know if he'd be limited. Yeah, um, you know, where I was disappointed, I thought this should have been the main event. I think the world title should always close out the show, and I know we'll get to the main event after this. But I love this, and I, you know, I think I had told you earlier, I think the one thing that Impact's missing is it's been a while since we've had a series, a good, long, drawn-out series. Like, I feel like with these two, two, you can have a trilogy, you know, know, do a best of uh, three, five, or whatever, some type of series, because they got great chemistry. And the fact that finally there's somebody who can stand toe-to-toe with Brian Cage and who's a legitimate threat 
and Michael Elgin. I think that goes a long way because that's the thing with Brian Cage. The way he's built, you think about some of the people he faces. Like when he faces Johnny, he's supposed to tear through Johnny. You know, but with a guy like Elgin, like Elgin can stand stand on his own. And yeah, they delivered. And I was annoyed with the Rhino interference only because I don't think they should waste Elgin feuding with Rhino. I think they the way that this match ended, it left the door for them to do a rematch. And I think having him feud with Rhino would be a waste of Elgin. If anything, I expected Rhino to interfere in Moose versus RVD, to be quite honest. But I'm just hoping that the Rhino stuff, because obviously he's still under contract in the other company, but hopefully they you know, continue with the Elgin vs. Cage because I think they could have something very special should they go down that road. Yeah, but I don't think they are. And I want to apologize. I called Swan versus Impact the semi-main because I knew the world title was after this, but I, I completely forgot Sammy and Tessa were the, the main event. But I, I think they're going to spin off uh, Michael Elgin into a program with Rhino here. Um, but we don't really know Rhino's situation. I mean, it was obviously him. So... Um, I enjoyed what they were doing with Don at first. And I really thought we were going to get like a really surprise run in. And I just thought it was really lackluster. Cause you know, I go back to double or nothing where Moxley came out, you know, uh, awesome Kong came out, you know what I mean? And then our surprises are Rhino, you know, uh, Tommy dreamer, RBD, like, <laughs> I mean, God, it's just no comparison, man. And that's, I, it's, it's a, I, I, I can't get into it, man. It, Obviously, he's going to be a part of the company for a little while, and we'll see what happens. But I, I, I don't, I can't, I don't think I can get into it. But Michael Elgin is, he has been amazing, you know, since coming to the company. I mean, dude, what he did in this match was bananas. And then Brian Cage, who was probably res wrestling hurt to an extent, I mean, he really went all out too. So this was a really, I'm, I'm calling it the main event. Um, and I, I did call it the main event earlier, so I apologize because, again, that's right. It wasn't the main. It was the semi. But as far as, like, world title matches, uh, this this was really up there. Uh, the main event of the evening, so the actual main event, was Tessa Blanchard versus Sammy Callahan. Now, this is this is one of the negatives I'm going to throw out there. Like, what a marketing no-go. What, what a marketing blunder to announced during the pay-per-view that this is going to be the main event and they didn't even announce it like sammy mentioned it was the main event if had we known that this was going to be the main event on television the story would have come across so much different on television and they could have marketed this as a first time ever intergender main event and it would have been controversial but it would have got people talking much more than elgin versus cage got people talking now that match was great but they didn't have any kind of con and if it had a very big fight feel cage looked like he wanted to kill him when he got to the ring but there was no real build to this on the te on the television show because he was hurt and had they said hey this is going to be the main event people who don't watch impact they would have at least been like what even if they wanted to talk shit and disagree with it it would have had people talking and i've been saying this since i've started the damn podcast and the channel like just the missed marketing opportunities with these guys sometimes like they could have promoted this so different the story the build would have been so different and people would have been more ex even you know i think most people if you unless you hate intergender wrestling were, were pretty excited for this you would have been really excited for it had you known it was going to be the main event because you would have known ahead of time oh shit if this is closing the show that means they're going to go above and beyond they're going to tell a great story you know, we're thinking it's going to be like the fifth match on the card or something like that. And randomly it's the main event. Yeah. I was say I was surprised with it. Um, you know, I, I kind of feel that, you know, it was kind of something they did on the whim. Um, you know, and I'll be honest, like I'm not no fan of intergender wrestling, but you know, this one, this was different just for a simple fact. Like, you know, I mean, I've told you, I said, a lot of times I've seen it and the stuff has been 50, 50, I mean, I was really surprised how much Callahan got in, and like he, it, to me, it just seemed like he was really beating on Tessa. Um, where I was surprised was 
to give the main event slot, you would think this is where Tessa gets her comeuppance. And I thought her losing, because you think about some of the stuff that that Sammy said. I know it's all storyline, obviously, but talking about you know this is a men's ring and no knockout can beat a man, and then it's like he was right. <laughs> and normally that's not how the story goes. So I just kind of thought if it was in the cards for Sammy to win, I don't think it should have been the main event. I think it should only have been the main event if you were really gonna go with Tessa uh, defeating Callahan. Yeah, so I read about this right before we got on with the podcast, and this was what I, actually I was. We just kicked it off, and I said I was going to talk about it when we recorded. Read an article that said the the, you know, and I I hate peeling back the curtain too much. I you know I really try to like be a fan and enjoy whatever what whatever we see on television. It's fun to guess and speculate, but I guess with Tessa they want her because dude Tessa selling by the way in this match was. I mean, what a freaking star she is. Like, her selling was amazing. Uh, her getting a little bit of color, even though it was by accident, was was a really nice touch. But what, what I was reading was the reason that Tessa lost the match is because they wanted her to chase. Um, whether whether it's Sammy, whether whatever the program is, they wanted her to be a little bit of a chase. They wanted her to have that underdog story a little bit, be at a disadvantage a little, because what, they, what, I, what I was reading and this is quoted by Impact Superfan Dave Meltzer. What I was reading is that they're trying to avoid a Roman Reigns Roman Reigns reaction with Tessa, to where Tessa just beats everybody, and we see that with with Madison Rain because she doesn't lose. So, you know, she's getting that a little bit where people are just like, "All right, here comes Madison, gonna win another match." Um, but I don't, I haven't gotten that with Tessa. Like, I think Tessa's lost way too much <laughs> since she's been a part of the company um speaking of madison range she's lost to her three times so if that says anything <laughs> you know to hear to, to hear that though and look i can only speak for myself and some people i've seen i don't think tessa would warrant that i think it's just you got people who aren't fans of intergender intergender um wrestling wondering well, why she dipping over here she hasn't even dominated the knockouts division like you know the one the one thing that that we notice a lot and I understand like you don't want the same people challenging over and over but it seems like when people lose their belts oh that's it they move on like Tessa's only held the, held the belt one time like I think if had she dominated a knockouts division where there's nothing more that she can do and she were to move on I could understand it a little bit more I don't think there's there they should be worried about a Roman Reigns backlash I think that'll happen if you have her continuing to beat up guys on the roster but if you have her in the knockouts division dominant i don't think that's going to be that'll that'll be an issue i will say this it seems like they wanted to give sammy a win because you know i've said it like nothing against the performer but he's booked to be a loser you know he comes out you know gets you invested in these programs and then ends up losing the big matches so i guess this considers a big win but you know, where do you go with both these participants now? And I think that's something that we were, you know, thinking about leading in. Like, if Tessa wins, what, is she going to, you know, go for the X Division title? Is she going to go for the world title? I mean, now does she go back to the knockouts? I mean, knockouts division? And then for Sammy, you know, how is she going to get a world title shot for beating the knockout? Like, I think that's just the weird, the weird thing in it all. But, yeah, I seen that article that you pointed out. Like I don't think she's gonna get the the Roman Reigns treatment. I just think there you got some people who don't want to see her beat up all the males when she hasn't dominated the knockouts division. Right, because she's had girls in the knockouts division that she hasn't she hasn't beat Madison Reign ever. Um, you know she's lost to, and I think she's beat her also, but she's lost to uh, Jordan Grace. She's lost a couple times at Ty. so she's she's lost a lot. So I, I don't think there's ever gonna be that kind of backlash. But I have the concern. You know, it's rumored that Tessa's contract runs throughout the rest of the year, like just like Taya's does. I, I have a concern that they're going to invest all this in her, and then she's going to leave in a year. I think it's really possible that she goes to AEW, and you know, when her contract is up, I think it's possible. I think it's likely. You know, um, not so much because it's the. I'm going to say it's a bigger company, and maybe I'll piss some people off, but um, I'm not going to say it's so much because of that. But I think Tessa wants as much variance in her competition as possible. I think she wants to dominate here, dominate there, 
dominate everywhere. Like, I think she, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if she gets a ring of honor run at some point. Like, I think she just wants to beat everybody everywhere. So, you know, that does concern me a little bit that they're going to build up towards something like maybe her even winning a world title. Um, and then, and then only to lose her, you know? So it's, it's one of those things though. We, we've seen this like, and I, I remember mentioning it. I said, you know, impact at this point, it's, it's a two year, two to three year company, like talents come in, they hone their craft and build their name for two to three years. And then some of them move on it, but it's also too why they need to be able to build multiple people at once where that way when one goes you can have someone else step up i think far too often the two th- mistakes that i see st- see them make just like previous regimes is they put all their eggs in one basket and every time somebody new comes in they cut in front of the line like i feel like some of the departures and i, I, I say this with cross for example like i honestly think if you know, if they didn't have the ECW guys that came in while he was still kind of getting his push and he was still kind of being used how he was used, I don't think we'd be hearing talks about him being released. I know there's a financial aspect of it all, but I just think every time someone new comes in, they're pushed to the front of the line. It's never they start from the bottom and work their way up. And then, you know, they these people get pushed, they build their name, and then they end up departing. So I just kind of just think if, you know, with Tessa or anybody, you, you got to know, hey, look, we have them. Let's utilize them while we have them. But let's be able to build other people, too. So in case they leave, like, we're going to be OK. Yeah, that's like, you know, I thought that was going to happen with Cross. I thought it was going to be a build up until, you know, we, we get this like big Brian Cage versus Cross match. But then we started getting Cross mixed with Brian Cage like really, really early. And, you know, they kind of kind of pushed them fast. And he was someone I thought was going to get a really, really nice slow burn, just just dominating people for a while. So I agree. You know, we bring someone new in um, and they come to the front of the line and it's, it, you know, they're actually using that as a storyline with Michael Elgin, uh, which had never made it, you know, that obvious before. But you're right. They come in, they they move to the front of the line. And this is something that the company's been doing for a long time. But I liked the end of this where. You know, because it's it's rare that you get a heel winning a pay per view and ending the night. It's it's, it's very rare. You know, um, Lashley closed out a couple pay per views. You know, against EC3 and Galloway, EC3 com- challenger for the twenty four seven title. You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but, but it's it's rare. You get someone to close out the show, especially Sammy, who's all in and being a heel. Like he's not getting no baby face pops out there like some guys get. Uh, so I thought it was a really nice ending the way he gave her the bat, you know, out of respect and then walked away. And I mean, they, they nailed that. I thought that was that was really perfect. But um, yeah, overall, this this pay-per-view gets an A. I, you know, I have very little to complain about it. Um, aside from Rhino, um, aside from not announcing that that was the main event previously, you know, and if, if, if you're making history, like make it a headline and, you know, obviously RVD's performance didn't really do it for me, but, uh, everything else really killed it. Great pay-per-view bound for glory will be in Illinois. So I will be there for show. Uh, it's going to be in the outskirts of Chicago. So I will definitely be there already talking about a lot of people talking with a lot of people that um, expect to be there as well. So do you got any closing comments? Oh, speaking of going to shows, I might, um, hopefully if the schedule permits impacts coming to Southern Cali. So I might actually be able to catch a show. My first show in the past 10 years. <laughs> when is that? So I didn't see uh, August 3rd. It's in Lo- it was in Los Angeles though. So, I mean, it's not super close. It was an hour away, but I'll digress, you know, but um, I'm kind of hoping that I can free myself up because, you know, that the last show I went to, I've always tell you, it's a 2009, it was a house show. And, you know, I've, I've always said, well, if they come out here, you know, I want to catch one. And a lot of times they go up north, which is like, you know, five, six hour drive, but I can do an hour or so. But no, as far as a pay-per-view, yeah, like I said, I thought it was solid. I, um, I actually had told my friend about it. I I really think 
and, and I hope it kind of gets the recognition that it deserves. But that Cage Elgin match, and I, I, I know you were saying that hopefully Elgin can move on, but I really think they would be doing a disservice to kind of, you know, go away from that because I think they can get at least a couple, three to four matches out of that. I mean, hell, we you just look at how much we got out of LAX and Lucha Brothers. We can do that with Cage and Elgin because they got great chemistry. Yeah. I, I mean, I could see that. I would enjoy it. I absolutely would. Because, again, you know, I can see him having a program with Moose. But, yeah, I, I would, after seeing this match, I'd like to see them keep going at it. Um, and, and Elgin is going to win the title at some point. Um, I'm glad they didn't didn't rush him. And we had no clue. I, I will say this about Slammiversary, and you cannot say this about 90% of the wrestling pay-per-views like this was not a predictable card you know there, there was a lot of matches on here where you had no idea who the hell was going to win it, it was not predictable uh, we had no clue for the most part for cage and elgin what they were going to do with that and uh you know that's props to them for this uh you know even as of us hardcore fans we didn't know what to expect who was going to win so give them a lot of love for it yeah, you got got to appreciate that because that that was the one match, man. I was like, okay, I know they don't want, they're not gonna let Elgin lose his first pay per view match, but this is Cage's first title defense, and I I thought that was a creative way they took the old Bret Hart Bulldog finish. So that's what I just feel like that opens the door for them to do a rematch, you know. And just the fact that to see Cage, you know, we've seen Cage be so dominant, and to see him kind of just you know met, meet his match, I just really thought that was exciting but yeah they delivered man kudos to them thanks for checking us out guys hope you enjoyed our review our takes a slam anniversary let us know what you thought of the show and for row this is bq and we'll talk to you next time peace <laughs>